check, check. Yep, can people hear me? Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Advanced Research Centre, the ARC. My name is Zara. And uh, when Stephen approached us about the ARC being the official hub for Doors Open Day, we were very excited. Um, it's amazing to see this building full of the public. Um, in case you're, you're not aware, the ground floor of this building is essentially a new community space for Glasgow. So the upper floors are occupied by researchers working on all kinds of things, but the ground floor is a permanent, permanently open space um, for the public, for you to come in, uh, to use our Wi-Fi, to have a coffee and, and to have conversations. So it's, it's amazing to have you here tonight. Um, this festival, the Glasgow Doors Open Day, overlaps with our festival, the Arcs Festival, called Arcadia, so a cheeky wee plug. Um, our festival starts on Friday. Um, we have all kinds of events, they're all free. We've got a screening of Mars Attacks on Friday night. We've got uh, live salmon on Sunday. We've got an outdoor Kaylee, all kinds of things. So please, um, if you're interested, check out the flyer. Um, but uh, I'm not gonna say much more, I'm just gonna hand over to Stephen. Thank you, Zara. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Sheriff. I'm the Events and Development Coordinator for Glasgow Building Preservation Trust. I'll ask everyone who was at the la last lecture to forgive me as I repeat myself. Um, Glasgow Building Preservation Trust is essentially a charitable property developer and we uh, repair, restore and return to their communities buildings at risk across the city. Uh, GBPT has delivered Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival in the city since 1990 and we work with the Scottish Civic Trust, the national coordinator, um, to open up buildings to the public for free for one week every single September. And Doors Open Days is um, in every region across Scotland now, so I encourage you to get out and visit um, other, other regions' celebrations. Um, we are very grateful to the University of Glasgow for hosting us here today, especially to Cassie Dillon, Zara Gladman, um, Kenneth Skeldon, who've been working alongside us to deliver this event. Um, another huge thank you has got to go to the tech team, um, and that's Colin Sloper, Andrew Lynch, and Daniel Wilton, and to Ev Buckley, who's here with us today, making sure that everything goes smoothly. Um, during the digital festival in 2020, um, we broadcast lectures live through our social media channels uh, all over the world and it was really um, well received um, and we had people uh, tuning in from Australia and New Zealand getting up at ridiculous times in the morning um, and so we're really keen to continue this and speakers aren't maybe as keen to be doing webinars but it does mean that when we broadcast these live through a YouTube channel um, they're automatically uploaded, uploaded to our digital archive and so if you know folks that um, weren't able to come along tonight um, or if you'd like to watch it again you can do so by um, logging on to our website and finding our YouTube channel. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our supporters, um, that's Glasgow City Council, the Arlington Baths, Page Park, Gardiner and Theobald and everyone else who you can see up on the screen here today um, without whom the festival would not be possible. Um, like many cultural events um, across the city and I'm sure across the UK, um, Doors Open Days is struggling to recover from um, the effects of the pandemic on our funding. Um, and so on the way out, we have um, volunteers who you're able to make a donation with. We also have our text donate line, um, if you would like to. And some one thing I forgot to plug last time is that we're selling the t-shirts as well. Um, so if you want to look cool at the festival this year, um, t-shirts are available for 15, 20 or 25 pounds, whatever donation you'd like to make to the event. Um, a couple of health and safety things to go through before we get kicked off. There are no fire drills planned this evening. Um, so in the unlikely event of a fire alarm, please uh, proceed through the doors behind you and then uh, across the way and through the doors at the back and the assembly point is in the courtyard um, just at the rear. Um, there are toilets at each end of the atrium and the nearest ones are by the stone arch uh, to the right, to my right. Um, so if you need assistance at any point, please just make yourself known to myself or to one of our volunteers and we will help you. Um, so on to tonight's event. Nori Wilson of, Last of Lost Glasgow is an idiot, but an idiot who loves the city. A journalist and writer, while all about is in flux, Nori tries to hold the centre, to remind us what we are, 
where we were and what we can be again. He first got up to speak at Doors Open Days in 2015 when his magic lantern show charmed a small crowd in the old British linen bank on the high street. And we haven't been able to shut him up since. So please join with me um, in welcoming Nori Wilson. Thank you. Am I okay in this one? Yes, I am okay in this microphone. That's good. Uh, I should probably say thank you for those kind words, but I did actually write them myself. <laughs> uh, and before I really begin, can I just say how nice it is to be back out speaking to a live audience after two and a half years of talking to folk on my laptop and all the rest of it. It's just so nice to get back out and actually speak to people and see the whites of your eyes. <laughs> uh, and when I began my working life almost <clears throat> 40 years ago, just up the road at the university's round reading room, never did I think that I'd ever be invited back to speak in one of the university's Howled Halls. What a mistake they've made tonight. It's a funny old life, isn't it? Uh, now, the theme of this year's festival is City in Flux. But Glasgow has always been a city in flux. Uh, hang on. Has the doofer been, yeah, the doofer's been removed. Here we go. Thank you, Stephen. As I say, Glasgow has always been a city in flux. It's face and streets forever changing. I mean, what we, what, where we are here at the moment, this wonderful new centre and all the new vistas that have opened up around the university with the demolition of the old Western Infirmary, that's just the latest incarnation of Glasgow stretching and yawning, flexing its muscles to become something new for the next generation of Glaswegians. And just as in my own lifetime, the rise of car culture saw streets and whole communities erased from the map for the building of the M8, previous Glaswegians saw whole areas sacrificed to the coming of the steam age and the arrival of the city's great stations. So tonight, come for a walk with me around a truly lost piece of Glasgow the more than square mile of the old city, which was swept away for the building of St Enoch Station. Now, see if my tech is working. Here we go. And make no mistake, this was almost a city within a city, a warren of wines, lanes, pens, back courts, workshops, factories, a human hive of brothels, music halls, bars, and illegal drinking dens. It was estimated at the time of the, the building of the station that the square mile behind it was contained 190 shabins and over 150 brothels. So that was our late Georgian and early Victorian ancestors. But here we are looking at Thomas Solwyn's wonderful 1864 panorama of the city. Uh, this is before either Central or Queen Street stations arrived. Uh, and Stoneman was hoisted high above the city in a balloon to draw this incredible perspective of Glasgow in 1864 uh, for the Illustrated London News. What's quite telling is, see if I get my own bearings, here's the original Bridge Street station uh, before the lines jumped the Clyde into where Central Station is now. So that's the original village of Grahamston, which was completely erased from the map for the building of Central. Uh, and if I look further up, uh, and I think uh, I think the Glasgow City Heritage Trust has very kindly put their own logo uh, over George Square, where you could see Queen Street Station, which was already there. But this is the area we're going to be looking at tonight. That's St Enoch Church, St Enoch Square, and this is the whole area, pretty well, that was swept away for the building of the station. Now, one of the problems back one, hang on, in putting together this talk, is that the demolished area is so poorly recorded, particularly in the photographic archive. So to get a sort of period feel for the area, I'll be drawing in this book, Shadow's Midnight Scenes, published in 1858. Uh, now, Shadow was the pen name of a Glasgow printer, Thomas Brown, who had an office in Argyle Street, so he knew the town really well. Uh, but as a citizen and social reformer, 
Even he was shocked by the poverty, crime, violence, drunkenness and deprivation he witnessed after dark in his own city, literally in his own doorstep. Back in the 1850s, most respectable folk in Glasgow were abed by 9pm. Not so the lower ranks of the city, who were out and out until all hours, shopping, drinking, dancing and brawling. So, much like today. <laughs> For one week in 1858, Brown left his home and his hearth to prowl the back streets of the city by night, recording his observations in the form of a diary. And make no mistake, if you can get a hold of a copy of this, it was republished in the 1970s. It's positively Dickensian. It's the rookeries of Oliver Twist and all the rest of it. You expect to bump into, yeah, who's the one with the bulldog? Bill Sykes, exactly. Uh, but it's all done not with a, an East End London accent. It's all Glasgow accents, Irish accents, Gaelic accents. It's that great coming together in the 1850s and the 1860s when Glasgow's population with the Industrial Revolution, potato famine in Ireland, clearances in the Highlands and clearances in the Lowlands, Glasgow becomes this magnet because if you're going to be poor and impoverished, you might as well be poor and impoverished working in a factory rather than poor and impoverished working in a bloody sodden field somewhere with the rain coming down on you. Uh, for some of the architectural history, I've also drawn on another book, uh, The Essential, Carol Freeman's brilliant book, Lost Glasgow. Sadly, no relation to a certain Facebook of the same name. So tonight, we're going to head east from the original whoop, Georgian St. Enos Square. In particular, I'm going to take you out carousing in the now vanished St. Enoch Wind, more in which later. And let's remember, Back one again, there we go. Let's remember, in the earliest days of St. Enos Square, this really was the West End of Glasgow. Christ, it was almost in Grahamston. You were almost out with the city boundary. Uh, as far as old Glasgow, it was centred around the cross and the cathedral and down to the Clyde. So this was practically off the map. It was out in the wilds near St. Thenew's Well, St. Thenew being the other name for St. Enoch, the mother of St. Mungo. Uh, and a spot famed in antiquity for its healing powers and a place of pilgrimage. What you see coming down here is the old St Enoch Burn, which still runs under the city in various buildings, including uh, the old Lewis's building. They've permanently had to have electric pumps in their basement because if they don't, every time there's a heavy shower of rain, the St Enoch Burn rises in all the basements start to flood, so an awful lot of the, the buildings around that way, uh, as I say, have pumps pretty well permanently running in their basements. So this is very early St Enoch Square with St Thenew as well. And here we are a wee bit later when the square has been properly enclosed. Here's the square in 1797 in its pre-railway heyday. Uh, when the original St Enoch's Church closed the vista down the still developing Buchanan Street with the Clyde and Carlton Terrace on the far side as a beautiful backdrop, the foundation stone of St Enoch's was laid in April 1780 uh, and it was built about 20 years after St Andrew's in the square but it very much was in a similar style and it was a, a green grass square surrounded by fine mansions the city's custom house was here, and on the left, the beautiful Adams-styled Surgeon's Hall uh, with its four columns above its main entrance. Very much similar in style to the city's old assembly rooms, which used to be in Ingram Street. And if you go down to Glasgow Green and walk through the McClelland Arch, you're actually walking through the great glazed window of the old assembly rooms in Ingram Street. Most folk think it's a door, but it was the great, huge arched window that was above the main doors. Nearby, whoop, on the corner of Argyll Street and Osborne Street, stood the city mansion of Provost Murdoch. There you go, my papers are sticking together. Uh, built in 1751. Uh, and right next door to him, 
the mansion of a subsequent provost, Colin de Nolop. In 1790, Murdoch's magnificent mansion was converted into the Buck's Head Inn, a favourite spot for visitors to the city. Here it is in all its, all its glory. Uh, that said, the poet laureate, laureate Robert Southey wasn't impressed by the place at all, writing in his diary, large as the house is, they had no room with a fire when we arrived cold and hungry at 10 o'clock on a wet morning. The inns in large cities are generally detestable, and this one in Glasgow does not appear to form an exception to the common rule. So hardly a, a five-star TripAdvisor review. Still, the old inn must have had its fans. I'm particularly fond of this advert, uh, particularly when you look down to the bottom. Obviously, people were meeting travellers coming off the train, and the travellers were saying, take me to the Buck's Head Inn, and they were saying, well, the, bucket, the Buck's Head Inn's full, come to this other place. <laughs> or they were just leading them to somewhere, somewhere else and telling them it was the Buck's Head Inn. Uh, and getting led astray and no doubt getting a wee backhander from the other inn and hotel owners in Glasgow. Sadly, the inn was demolished in the 1860s, and if you walk down Argyle Street now, Alexander Greek Thompson's magnificent Buck's Head warehouse sits on the site uh, just to the east uh, of what was Lewis's department store. Colin Dunlop's mansion survived a wee bit longer. Dunlop was one of the founders of the commercial greatness of Glasgow. He established the firm of Colin Dunlop and Sons, whoop, one of the great Virginia houses, so technically a tobacco lord, so his hands were far from clean when it comes to matters of slavery and dealing in human traffic. But along with his brother, Robert of Housel, and a few principal merchants of Glasgow, he also originated in 1750 the first Glasgow bank, the Ship Bank, uh, and if you walk down the salt market today, the Ship Bank pub is built on the site of the original Ship Bank. Uh, and why the Ship Bank? Because that was where Glasgow was making its money, in shipping and transportation. Uh, he was also a bailey in 1747 and 1761, Dean of Guild of the Trades in 1759, and Provost in 1770, eventually dying in 1777. Dunlop Street is named after him. But over time, as Glasgow grew up around his mansion, the backlands to this building were built up to become an area known as Wilson's Court, sadly no relation to me, uh, home to some really upmarket shops and into places of entertainment, David Brown's Philharmonic Hall and the Royal Music Hall. When the 300-seat Glasgow Music Hall occupied Wilson's Court, it also boasted a 60-foot-long American bowling alley and an indoor curling saloon with a curling rink made out of polished metal uh, so that folk could play the roaring game indoors in all seasons. But as Music Hall declined, the space was converted to become a cinema uh, with the alley on the right hand side there uh, covered over to provide access to the, the Argyle Electric Picture House. This picture was taken just prior to 1922, when Dunlop's fine mansion, at that point, the oldest building in Argyle Street, uh, was demolished to create a larger Art Deco frontage uh, for the cinema. There you want it. And I have, needless to say, got a page out of order. Da -da -da. That's what happens when you, you print stuff off and your printer spits them all onto the floor. So what am I looking for? Hang on. This should be fun. Come on. You'll have to excuse me as I say, I've not been out for a wee while. Here we go. Here we go. I think the rest of it's all out of order as well, but we shall... Oh, bugger. <laughs> what did I say? We shall deal with that as we get to it. Yeah, the picture house eventually closed in March 1960, demolished in 63, 
Uh, and today the mansion site is home to that Miro of shops, so sort of low-level shops that has also got the entrance to the Argyle Line station, Argyle Street station. Uh, so as I say, this was just before it closed down, they're having a compulsory removal sale. And I'd love to know what sort of bargains you could have got in there that day. Uh, you get a better idea of the area lost to the building of the station in this aerial view uh, with the rail lines snaking away east and south. So make no mistake, I mean, St. Enoch's, St. Enoch's was an absolute monolith. When the station hotel first opened, this great cliff of ornate red sandstone, it was the largest hotel in Scotland and the third largest in the whole of Europe. That's the, I'm very fond of this wee bit, that's the now vanished carriage drive running up the north side of the station. A remnant of the day was the days when private carriages and handsome cabs would clatter up that ramped entrance, delivering or picking up well-heeled passengers, then doing a wee burl about and escaping back into the city along carriage drive. I also love this luggage label for the old hotel, uh, mainly because whoever did it, they've misspelt the manager's name. <laughs> it should be I before E. Uh, and this was the, the Swiss-German Ernest theme. Uh, and he was in good company because his older brother, Albert theme, also managed one of Glasgow's great hotels, the Windsor Hotel, on the corner of St Vincent and Douglas Streets. Uh, and they were a pair of Swiss German brothers uh, who had come over to the UK and had actually both started out in business in Edinburgh. Uh, but as Glasgow started to attract more and more custom, they both thought, right, time to head west. Uh, and we'll do better through there. Now imagine if you'd ordered up thousands of those luggage labels and they had the, the wrong spelling on them. You've got to imagine somebody get their jotters for that. Uh, and you never know, you never knew who you might bump into in carriage drive. Debbie Harry from Blondie, uh, photographed by her then boyfriend, Chris Stein, uh, in May 1977. And loads of folk often ask me, you know, Nori, if you had a time machine, you know, which period of Glasgow history would you go to? Well, one of the ones that I would definitely go to is one weekend in May in 1977, when the cream of the New York punk scene came to Glasgow. Uh, on the Friday night, you could have gone up to Strathclyde Students' Union and seen the talking heads support the Ramones. And on the Saturday night, you could have gone to the old Apollo and seen Blondie supporting television. Now, if that's not a weekend to remember, and I'm, I'm, it's all, it always makes me furious because I've got a couple of older mates who were at both those gigs, <laughs> including one who took his Ramones album, the first Ramones album, uh, along to their sound check at Strathclyde, hoping to get it signed by the band, and he didn't, but Debbie Harry signed it for him. <laughs> So he's probably got the only copy of the first Ramones album in the world that's got a great big love to Robert, Debbie. And he keeps it very, very securely in a plastic jacket. And anytime I'm, he's like, Nori, you want swine, you absolute swine. Now, as I say, half the trouble of doing this talk is that the area lost to the station is so poorly recorded in the photographic archive. And that is actually quite strange. <coughs> because at the same time the demolition work was going on for St Enoch Station, Thomas Annan, really the father of Glasgow photography, he was busy up the high street photographing the back courts of the old high street for the City Improvement Trust uh, before they were swept away. And more modern, I'm saying more modern, we're talking yeah, housing the, up in the high street, that some of it really did date back to the, the late 1600s and folk were still living in it. Uh, and then all of a sudden the City Improvement Trust comes along and starts building more modern tenements. You walk up the high street today and the lovely red sandstone tenements, if you look up, you'll see Glasgow City Improvement Trust on them. Also a lot of the tenements, well, the surviving tenements around Glasgow Cross uh, and down the salt market 
are all Glasgow City improvement trust buildings. So even at that point, Glasgow was trying to better itself for all its citizens. Uh, so just imagine all that demolition work, all that change, all that flux going on around St Enoch's, and none of it seems to have been recorded photographically. Now that's not to say photographs of it don't exist. Uh, there may be some you know, dirty old glass plate negatives hidden somewhere away in the archives of the City Union Railway Company. But if there are, they've never been digitised. I've never managed to track them down. Uh, and this is the sort of conditions we're talking about up off the high street. It's another spectacular Anon image. Now, cameras were certainly in hand in 1925 uh, when the old St Enoch's church came down, annoyingly to make room for more buses outside the station. And if you look right up at the top of the spire, you'll see one brave fella taking down the weather vane, uh, which always gives me the heebie-jeebies. Uh, I mean, I show younger friends this photograph, they often exclaim, exclaim yeah, flux sake, they demolished that for a bus station. Also, on hand in 1977, when the the old approach bridges to the station were finally brought down. This is us in Stockwell Street. The, the original Stockwell China Bazaar was just in and right there underneath that bridge. Uh, and this is the sort of my sort of time, what would I be? I'd be 10 or 11 when that happened. And that sort of whole period of my childhood of just getting to know the city, it was that period of stewer and black snotters because there was so much demolition going on in the city. And there was also so much stone cleaning going on in the city. You'd, reg you'd walk down one street one day and all the tenements would be absolutely black. You'd go back three weeks later and they'd all be absolutely golden. But the pavement would be about a foot deep in beautiful sand. And it meant like kids were literally sitting outside their closes building sandcastles <laughs> with the stuff that had been scrubbed off the front of their own building. So... Back to St Enoch's Wind, and that's us. Whoop. No, see if I get my right. St Enoch's Wind is actually hidden away in the middle, in there. Uh, and this, again, as I say, Wilson's Court was a great place of entertainment, but so was St Enoch's Wind. That's where Shearer's White Debate Rooms were regarded as one of the city's top singing saloons. And in the days before purpose-built music halls, this was more of a, a big sort of bar restaurant with a stage at one end, where you could turn up, you could have a drink, you could dance, you could dine all the time while watching the turns up on the stage. There you went, and I'm back out of order again. Toot, toot, toot. Helps if I probably show the next picture. Yep. So, yeah. That was 22. That's what I get for throwing my notes up in there. Bloody hell. Oop. Talk amongst yourselves.
So we'll, we'll press on to the next one. So these are adverts uh, from the, the various entertainments at the White Bait Room. Uh, and the White Bait Room, as I say, it was one of Glasgow's favourite places. And one of the reasons that the music halls were so important, if you imagine that most kids were leaving school at 12 or 13, 14 at most, and got into a trade. So by the time they're 16, they're earning money and they want to go out for a night's entertainment. And this really is the equivalent of, yeah, going to a pop show because the singers are up singing the hit songs of the day. And it's also one of the few social spaces in Glasgow where young men and young women can meet unchaperoned and have a right old tear, yeah, have something to drink, have some chips, you yeah, know, all, all the things that kids still look, young, young folks still love to do today. They were doing it in places like this. Uh, and the white paint continued uh, under, it was a Mr. Shearer who originally owned it, and when he died, his wife Elizabeth inherited it, uh, and she kept it going for a few more years, uh, despite the fact that the police recommended that no new drinks licenses were issued uh, for the place. Uh, and this became a serious matter. She decided to reopen it uh, as a, a temperance concert room. Now, as you can imagine, there wasn't much business in that. Uh, and it rapidly sort of started to go downhill. Uh, much as, and it's a bit like today's, Uncle Good in the city chambers taking a dim view of nightclubs and late licenses in the city. Yeah, it's all right, and we're having a year of the culture, and bars can stay open until three, and clubs can stay open until five o'clock in the morning. But as soon as the visitors go away, we're left with, no, it's midnight, away you go home. It's two o'clock in the morning, no, the bar's shut, away you go home. Uh, so at that point, Mrs. Shearer decided to do the, the sensible thing. Uh, and at that point, the railway company who were looking to buy up all the land offered her £3,400 compensation for the old music hall, uh, which she rapidly stuck in her purse uh, and retired down the course to Helensborough. Uh, the wind was also home to the Night Asylum for the Houseless and House of Industry for Indig... I can never say it. Indigenic... Indig indig Indigent. I can never say that word. Females. Uh, this is it in 1844. Uh, a particularly severe winter in Glasgow in the west of Scotland in 1837-1838 had greatly raised public concern about the plight of the homeless in the city. Uh, so the Night Asylum for the Homeless opened in 1830, run by a board of directors with William Campbell, great name, William Campbell of Tully Tewin, as it's present. Uh, and it was a former granary building, uh, which had been converted for the purpose. Hope, hope, hope. And I've just found that page that I was looking for earlier. <laughs> typical, typical. Uh, because the White Bait, as I say, had opened as a singing saloon in 1854. Also in the wind were warehouses, bonded stores, printing offices, uh, a brass founders, a &J Stewart's tube works, which remarkably still survives today as Stuart and Lloyd steel tube makers in the city. Uh, numerous workshops, including, strangely enough, a whole handful of watchmakers, which explains pretty well why the Argyle Arcade is still the home to jewellery and watches in Glasgow. Uh, and also John, John Kirksop's hat manufactory. Uh, the White Bait, White Bait could provide entertainment for 400 people in its hall on the first floor. Uh, it had private boxes, side rooms, suitables for dinners and suppers. Uh, the ground floor store was rented out by others. Uh, and the White Bait had a frontage on St Enoch's Wind and then an exit door on St Enoch's Lane. Uh, and the top floor of the building uh, was rented to the Morning Bulletin, uh, an early Glasgow newspaper. Uh, at one point, architect James Smith 
who had laid out Blyswood Square and designed most of the, a lot of the buildings around Blyswood. He proposed what was to be called the Union Arcade, similar to the Argyle Arcade, starting opposite the Argyle Street entrance to the Argyle Arcade. And the plan was that they would buy up all the properties in St. Enoswind, create this new arcade and glaze it over. Uh, and it's one of these sort of strange things. In a city as wet and at times as miserable as Glasgow, why we don't have more you know, covered over shopping arcades? At one point there were, I think I'm right in saying, eight in the city. Uh, and now we're basically just down to, to one near Gaila Arcade. Because uh, the idea of indoor shopping, you know, a variety of shops, I mean, I suppose now it would be the equivalent of the St. Enoch Centre, uh, but much more charm uh, in these sort of old Victorian uh, or late Georgian ones. Uh, the area. Hang on, see if we get, get back to the right bit. Uh, yeah, through the back, from the, the white bait, there was also one of the city's old houses. I don't think it was this one. I think this is the what was known as the Easter Sugar House, which was out the Gallagate, uh, with fires burning day and night, literally 24-7. The huge pans of uh, raw cane sugar uh, getting boiled down to produce fine white sugar. Uh, with the leftover molasses used to make and distill Glasgow rum for the famed Glasgow punch. Because in the days before whiskey became a respectable spirit and a, a legally controlled spirit, rum and the punch made from it with rum, sugar, limes was the drink of choice of the Glasgow gentry, served cold in summer and hot in winter. Uh, and if you look up, you can still find recipes for it online, and it sounds pretty much like a real rocket fuel, not so much a punch, more of a, more of a headbutt, a, gla a Glasgow kiss. Uh, and if you go to the People's Palace, you'll see, and I can't remember, I think it's the punch bowl. Now, is it from the, it's from one of the old Glasgow hotels. At the Saracen Head, thank you. Uh, and I think it could hold five gallons. Uh, and they'd be, make, they'd, be you know, they'd finish that and then they'd make another batch and they'd finish that and they'd make another batch. Uh, they'd just keep going until you know, ring around on your roses, we all fall down. Uh, so they were having a, a rare old time of it. Uh, so, as I say, this area, there was so much going on in it, but particularly with the, the sugar houses going day and night, it makes me think of the old Kelvin Hall Carnival for the, you know, the smell of elephant dung mixed with that of candy floss. You had that same sort of sweet and sour, should we say, scent uh, going through the city. And make no mistake, back at this point, drink was a real problem in this area, uh, as was poverty. Oh. Oh. Uh, Frederick Engels, at that time working in the Manchester Guardian, uh, and later to obviously write uh, the Communist Party Manifesto with Karl Marx, uh, when he put together his conditions of the working class in England of 1844, he did that usual thing. He, called the book The Working Class of England, when in fact he was looking at the whole of Great Britain. Uh, and one of his northern correspondents sent in this report of what he found in Glasgow. I've seen human degradation in some of its worst phases, both in England and abroad. But I can advisedly say that I did not believe until I visited the wines of Glasgow that so large an amount of filth crime, misery, and disease existed in any one spot in any civilized country. The wines consist of long lanes, so narrow that a cart could with difficulty pass along them. Out of these open the closes, which are courts about 15 or 20 feet square, round which the houses, 
mostly three or four stories higher built. The centre of the court is the dunghill, which probably is the most lucrative part of the estate to the layer in most instances, and which would consequently be esteemed an invasion of the rights of property to remove. In the lower lodging houses, 10, 12, or sometimes 20 persons of both sexes and ages sleep promiscuously on the floor in different degrees of nakedness. These places are generally, as regards dirt, damp and decay, such as no person of common humanity would stable his horse in, aye, the good old days. And disease was absolutely rife, as you can imagine, uh, in such close quarters. Uh, I think this is us on Salt Market here, and the crowds have all turned out to get their photos taken. Uh, but as I say, disease was absolutely rife. You look at the, the areas in pink. Uh, this is a, a cholera map uh, of early 19th century Glasgow when cholera outbreaks were still a regular occurrence. Uh, in 1911, I think I'm right in saying Glasgow even had an outbreak, an outbreak of the plague. Uh, I think that was only two deaths. Uh, and they blamed it, of course, you know, the usual incomers. It's incomers coming up the Clyde have brought the plague into Glasgow. And they worked out, even just in the last couple of years, there was a chap uh, at one of the Oxbridge universities did a huge study and they worked out that it had actually come up from Bristol. <laughs> uh, and alcohol wasn't the only problem in Glasgow at that point. Some manual workers in Glasgow would buy raw opium to suck on or soap in their beer. You could buy it out of the local chemist to get them through their daily. And you're working a 12-hour shift, often outdoors. And to get through that, you, you sometimes needed what you could call a wee bit of wind assistance behind you. Uh, while many middle-class Glaswegians would pop in the local chemist for a pint of laudanum. English poet and essayist Thomas de Quincey writer of Confessions of an English Opium Eater. He even set up in home in Glasgow for a time uh, to outrun his creditors mainly. Uh, and he lived in a house, well, a cottage at that point, if you can imagine that, a cottage on Renfield Street, uh, the site of today's De Quincey House, which is a lovely big red brick. Some of you may be an age, of an age to remember uh, the pub that used to be called De Quincey's, diagonally opposite the entrance to the old ABC cinema. It was the, the Quincy's upstairs with its spectacular tiled interior, and downstairs was Brahms and List, which was slightly more down market with great big barrels of monkey nuts. So every time that you walked in, you sort of walked in a crunching floor <laughs> of discarded nutshells. Uh, so he, he lived in Renfield Street, and I presume the, the creditors caught up with him there because he, he very rapidly moved up to Rotten Row. Uh, up beside the old infirmary, which I suppose would be quite handy if you wanted to pop in for a, some more of the, the laudanum. And the drink problem, as I say, in Glasgow was severe, uh, and it saw thousands of middle-class and working-class Glaswegians take the pledge, and that's them doing it in Glasgow Green, uh, pledging you to lay off strong drink, the old you Lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm of an age, I grew up with a, we, call, we called her Aunt Nan, she wasn't really an aunt, she'd been a friend of my granny's, uh, and she had taken the pledge age 12 and lived to be 98 and never in her life touched drink at all. Although she was very, very fond of various tonic wines. <laughs> which she believed to be completely innocuous until you read the back of the label and went, aye, she doesn't drink, aye, she gets through a bottle of that every Saturday. <laughs> uh, another great and more recent loss uh, down about the station area was this, uh, you can just make out the name of it, Garrick's Temperance Hotel. Uh, and again, that's a hotel with nay bar. Uh, not much used to most folk in Glasgow. And this is in Stockwell Street, uh, which was once, after Proven's Lordship, the city's second oldest house. Uh, it was erected in 1678, 
possibly as part of a larger townhouse for a wealthy merchant. Uh, but it spent most of the 19th century and part of the 20th century as the Garrick. Uh, and in a city which built its wealth in sugar, tobacco and slaves, the old hotel should have been preserved because it was the meeting place of Glasgow's early abolitionists. Uh, this was where they held their meeting, you can imagine, in a city whose wealth was built in sugar and slavery. Abolitionists weren't very popular, but Glasgow, surprisingly, had a very, very strong abolitionist movement, basically through the Church of Scotland. Uh, it was a very, very powerful movement in Glasgow. Uh, this was also in 1847, where the, the famous Swedish opera singer Jenny Lind stayed uh, while she performed in Glasgow. Uh, and if you know the name Jenny Lind, you'll probably know it as a, a roundabout road junction out in the south of the city. Quite why a roundabout road junction in the south side of the city should be named after a, a 19th century Swedish opera singer, I have not a clue. Uh, and as I say, this, this place was quite important. It was, it was where the, the old Glasgow club uh, was formed in 1900, and the old Glasgow club is still going strong, still has monthly meetings. Uh, I think they now meet out at Adelaide's church whoop, in the city centre, and they regularly invite folk like me along to speak, but they always have a fascinating winter season of talks. Uh, it was also the home of the Isley Association and the Sky Association. So again, we're talking about these Highland communities coming down to Glasgow and finding a place where they could meet fellow Islanders and talk, talk in their own Gaelic and find out what was happening back up the road. You know, did you hear so-and-so has got married? Oh, did you hear so-and-so has got widowed? Oh. Uh, so all that sort of stuff was going on. Now, sadly, after lying neglected for many years, uh, and the then owners, many unsuccessful applications to have the Garrick demolished. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that one night in 1975, it went on fire. Yeah. Uh, and if you're walking down Stockwell Street today, from Argyll Street, where the, the road turns into the parking uh, for the St Enoch Centre, that's where the Garrick used to sit. Now, if, as Shakespeare says, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, then Glasgow is very much my stage, your stage. It's the architectural backdrop to which we live our lives. So I'll end in a, a Shakespearean tale. This is the old Theatre Royal in Osborne Street with whoop, up top, Old Will, uh, leaning on a pile of books uh, around the room, it carved all the world's a stage. But the remarkable thing is, that's not where the statue started life. Its first perch was in the, the fa facade of the city's first theatre in Alston Street, the Alston Street Theatre in Grahamston, which at that point was out with the city boundary because the local Baileys in Glasgow wouldn't license a theatre within the city. Theatre at that point was looked on as slightly Catholic, slightly popish, uh, and a bit, you know, just not needed in Glasgow. What was it I said about the, the Uncle Goods and their dim view of Glasgow folk having fun? So they banished the first proper theatre out with the city boundary. Uh, the city theatre, the, the Alston Street Theatre, didn't actually do that well. Uh, it burnt down on its opening night <laughs> <laughs> uh, and was rebuilt. Uh, an old will survived in there. So he survived two fires at the Alston Street Theatre until it was demolished. And when it was getting demolished, the developers of the Theatre Royal said, you doing anything with that Shakespeare statue? We have it. So he got plonked up in the front of this theatre where he remarkably survived another two fires at this location. 
So just think of all the change, all the flux that William Shakespeare has witnessed in Glasgow since he was first erected in 1764, over a decade before the creation of modern America. Change, you see, flux, if you like, it's inevitable, both in cities and in people. A city that doesn't change and adapt is a dead city, it's a city set in aspic. The challenge we always face, and particularly at this time in Glasgow, when we look at Sucky Hall Street and various other once grand thoroughfares, which are a bit down in their uppers at the moment, is to preserve and repurpose the best of the old while looking to a brighter future. Look around you when you step outside this magnificent building and the new buildings emerging in the site of the old Western Infirmary. They are part of that change, that flux, part of that brave new world, as, all, as we all are. Now, today, as befits a retired writer, old Will spends his time in the garden, in the grounds of a Victorian mansion up in Kermunnock, which was built for the Greenlees family. And I've never been able to work out whether it was the Greenlees shoe shop family or the Greenlees whiskey blenders family. I suspect the whiskey blenders because the Greenlees whiskey blenders had huge arcades underneath St. Enoch Station for they would mature and age whiskey. So I suspect when the neighbouring theatre was eventually getting demolished, they did what the owners of the theatre had done previously and said, you do end with that Shakespeare statue. And it became a lovely piece of garden, garden ornament, which it still is today. And as Shakespeare wrote, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. And that's as true today of you, of me, and of Glasgow as it ever was. So at that point, I will exit stage left, pursued by a bear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Nori. Uh, it's always great to have you here, to hear the stories and to see all the amazing images that you've collected. And always really shocking to see all the buildings that Glasgow's lost. Um, I'd like to open it up yeah. to the floor to see if anyone wants to ask a question. Yeah, okay, great, and I'll pass you the mic. Nari, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'd, I'd like you to look into your crystal ball, um, if possible, uh, given that you're such a, a scholar of change in Glasgow, and tell us what you think the impact of the pandemic will be on the built architecture of the city. It's a strange one. I mean, my one real fear at the moment, uh, and it's, it's almost a post-pandemic problem, is what the effect of power prices will have on buildings in the city, particularly nighttime economy, restaurants, bars, all the places that we all love to go. Because uh, unless they get more help, I think we're going to see, I mean, we saw a lot of bars closed during the pandemic, uh, but I think the current surge in power prices is simply going to kill an awful lot of those businesses stone dead because there's, there's simply no way they can raise their prices to compensate for the, the, the huge rises in their energy bills. Uh, and that not only applies to you know, things in the city, but it's also all the supply side chain. You know, how's a bakery going to keep going you know, when they're running ovens 24-7? How are distillers that need heat to... Yeah, there's so many things going to impact. One thing, I mean, you, you sort of see it with Sucky Hall Street to a certain extent. Uh, I hope that more people will actually move back into the city centre, that the city centre will become again a 24-hour city, not the way it is so often these days that, you know, pretty well Monday to Friday, large parts of the city are just dead after five o'clock. Uh, and Glasgow has always suffered 
slightly from that gerrymandered donut political effect where so many wealthy middle class people who work and earn their money in Glasgow choose to live just out with the Glasgow boundary and contribute nothing to the city in terms of council tax and yet use our services, leaving Glasgow with a rump population with a large percentage of unemployed and lower paid workers who basically are subsidising all these nice middle class folk to come in and use our galleries, our theatres and all the rest of it, which we pay for. Uh, so I would like to see more people back in the city. I'd like to see buildings that were previously used as houses, but have since become commercial premises, go back to being livable communities. The great buzzword at the moment is, what is it, a 20 minute community where you, you have everything within 20 minutes walking or cycling distance of your home, your place of work, a place of entertainment, the rest of it. The sooner Glasgow gets back to being like that, the better. I mean, we're blessed, even though the beaching cuts cost us city and station, Glasgow is considerably more blessed than Edinburgh in that we still have much of our local railway infrastructure. Edinburgh lost so much of that, and yet Glasgow managed to hang on to it. And that's brilliant, but our, our bus, our privatised bus services are absolutely hopeless. And yet Edinburgh managed to hang on to its council-controlled bus services, Lothian buses. So you look at what's been happening in the continent, particularly in Spain and Germany in the last couple of months, where they basically just said, right, flat fares for the whole summer, anywhere you want to go. I think, I think in Germany, was it nine, nine pounds for a month? And that was one ticket and you could use it as many times as you wanted. And they saw, I think it was a jump of something like 45% in rail journeys. So they actually made money on it. Uh, and that's the sort of thing we need more of. We need more of that sort of out the box thinking. Scotland, we like to think we're you know, leading the way sometimes, but quite often we're, we're trying to fix old problems that have already been fixed somewhere else by looking at old solutions. And we need to look at new solutions for the city. Because uh, Glasgow, as we know it, didn't just magically happen. Glasgow took the best part of 300 years to evolve to what it became. Uh, and if you think 1920s, Glasgow had a population of 1.2 million. And that was Glasgow, Glasgow, without counting the surrounding area. And yet the greater Glasgow conurbation now is just down to about 550,000. We need that volume of people to make things work, to have things in your doorstep so that you don't have to go on a bus or go on a train to go and do something. You can just step out your front door and walk 10 minutes that way to the library or walk 15 minutes that way to the cinema. And I think that sort of stuff really does knit a community together, a community together and knits a city together. Because you know what it's like if you're anywhere else in holiday and you hear a Glasgow voice, you don't say, are you from Glasgow? You immediately say, where in Glasgow are you from? Because Glasgow is still that succession of small, important communities. Yeah, you meet someone from England, you say, where are you from in England? And they'll tell you, they'll say, oh, I'm from Manchester or from Liverpool or whatever. But you meet a fellow Glaswegian, you say, where are you from? Partick, Hillington, Cardonald, Penaline, Springburn because we're all tied to those wee places that go together to make up the bigger Glasgow. And I think that's a lovely thing. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling answer, right? <laughs> Cheers for that. Um, I was just thinking there when you were showing that map at the beginning, um, what was the reason for, you know, needing Central Station and St Enoch Station? Was that the sort of first uh, class B McGill's of the day? You've, you've got to go back. It was competing private railway companies. Uh, so St Enoch was the Glasgow and South West, I think, railway company. Central was the Caledonian railway company. Uh, and you also have to understand that all the competing railway companies, they didn't only have trains, they also had steamboats, which is where the term steaming <laughs> comes from. Uh, so you, know, you could literally by if you were coming up on the west coast line which was the uh, the caledonia railway line 
you could literally go into a tra travel agent in London, you know, Thomas Cook or somewhere and say, I want to go from London to Sky. And you would get a through ticket with a steamship ticket because you'd come up the West Coast and the Caledonian line, you'd get to Glasgow, you'd step off at Glasgow Central, you'd walk down the stairs to the Broomielaw and you'd step on a paddle steamer owned by the Caledonian Railway, which would take you right away up the Western Isles. And again, it goes back to the idea of integrated transport. You know, it worked. And yet again, you know, something that's working, let's break it up and sell it off to competing bodies. And it just doesn't work. And it's that strange thing, the old form of private ownership did seem to work because the, the folk that actually owned it lived here and used it. Whereas the modern form of privatization, the folk that actually own it are multinationals, they're pension funds. None of them have to get on a bus or a train in Glasgow or try and get the underground after six o'clock on a Sunday night. <laughs> They're all living somewhere else and not paying any tax here and probably paying as little tax on their investments as possible. So yeah, if the folk that own it aren't using it, then the service level, yeah, it's lowest common denominator stuff. Do we have any other questions? I think, and it's, sadly, it's one that's been at risk for a long time, and I don't know if there's any way of saving it. It's Lion Chambers in Hope Street, uh, which is just, just an absolute, it's, it's like a Ruritanian fantasy of a building. Uh, but needless to say, it was built, so I, I'm trying to remember the, the exact date of it, uh, but it was built using a very, very pioneering form of early precast concrete called the Hulebeck system. Uh, so it's not built brick by brick by brick, it's these huge steel re reinforced concrete panels which start out at the bottom of the building about that wide, but as you up to the top of the building, I think the office is up at the top, the walls are only four inches thick. Uh, and the trouble is, as I say, because it was an early pioneering form of steel re reinforced concrete. Over the years, water gets into the steel reinforcers. They start to rust. They start to expand. The concrete starts spalling off. And short of actually completely demolishing it and rebuilding it again as was, I don't think there's any financial way that the building can be saved. I mean, I know, uh, I think Glasgow Building Preservation Trust have looked at it years ago. Glasgow City Heritage Trust have looked at it years ago. I've got piles of reports going back about 20, 30 years. And even 20, 30 years ago, they were saying, yeah, 25 million to, to rebuild. Uh, and uh, technically, no financial way of actually repairing. Uh, so, and again, it, it was built by a, a well-known, and again, I've forgotten who, who it was that actually funded it. It was a well-known Glasgow lawyer. Uh, and the remarkable thing is, shop at ground floor, I think the shop is actually currently reopened again, shop at ground floor, legal offices on the first two or three floors, and then practically all the floors above it were specifically built as artist studios with great windows in the north side, so they all capture that magic north light, so you're not getting a direct sunlight when you're trying to paint or draw. So it's this remarkable building that was various things, but as I say at the time, it was originally built as lawyer offices and artist studio. I just love the fact that there was a wealthy enough lawyer in Glasgow who was so fond of art that he decided, I'm gonna build an office block, but half of it is going to be for artists. I think that's a wonderful bit of forward thinking. I have time for one more question. I think I saw a hand, yeah. Um, a more general question. I love the old photographs that you put out in social media. Are you still coming across new collections of photographs? I mean, do you ever get them like, in people's personal collections? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, and it's, <coughs> it's one of these sort of strange things because I was what, 14 years on the Herald and Evening Times uh, and every day I was writing the, the memories sort of page thing. So I 
knew the the Herald Evening Times picture archive really well, and then I started speaking to mates at the Scotsman, so I get ar access to the Scotsman archive. But it's the most the most stuff that I post. All of a sudden, folk come out the woodwork and say, "Would you like to see?" And I say, "Of course, I'd bloody like to see." <laughs> uh, just in the last two or three years, uh, I think it must be about three years ago now, a chap contacted me, uh, a lovely guy called Joss, Joss Treen, who lived in Great George Street, just off Byers Road, uh, when he was a student. Uh, and when he finished his degree at Glasgow, he was unemployed for about two years. Uh, so every fortnight when he got his brew money in, he'd go and buy some film and go out he was unemployed, so he would just basically go out and let his nose lead him, and he'd walk about the city photographing stuff. Uh, and he went on and had a spectacular career with Rolls Royce, working all over the world, now lives down in Manchester, and about three years ago he contacted me out the blue and said, Nori, I took all these photographs in 1977 and 78. He says, but it's been that long since I've been in Glasgow. He says, I don't know where half of the places are. Could you help me identify where I took? He started sending me these pictures. They're just wonderful. Because even though we think, yeah, 1977 is just a couple of years ago, but the city has changed so dramatically in those years. Uh, and then he started sending me batches of them. And each batch he sent me were better than the previous batch. And the ones that I couldn't put a name to or a location to stick up in Lost Glasgow within two minutes. Someone would say, that's the corner of such and such street and such and such street. My dad used to drink in that pub. And we managed to put locations to every single photograph. And eventually, Joss went, you know, it'd be really nice you know, if I could have a, an exhibition of these pictures. So again, I just stuck it out in Lost Glasgow and said, look, if you've been following, you'll have seen all Joss's wonderful images. And within about three minutes, my friends at Mary Hill Borough Halls, uh, immediately, because there was a lot of Mary, great Mary Hill photos, they immediately got in touch with me and said, well, you've got wall space. So pretty well 40 years after the pictures had been taken, they ended up coming back to Glasgow, getting a lovely exhibition at Mary Hill Borough Halls. Uh, Joss very kindly asked me to write a, a brochure for the, the exhibition. Uh, and he's now doing a second project around Mary Hill Borough Halls about people's Mary Hill memories, but referencing the pictures as sort of source points. And more and more of that's happened, you get, I mean, Joss hadn't looked at his pictures until he retired, when he picked up his camera again and he thought, I've got a loft full of old photographs that I've never looked at, that nobody else has ever seen. And that's the sort of brilliant stuff that I get, because folk, folk know I've got an audience. And when I started doing this, I thought I'd have maybe five or 8,000 fellow sort of history and art geeks and architecture geeks. Uh, and Lost Glasgow is approaching 400,000 followers now, and it's all over the world to such an extent. There's loads of folk all over the world who have absolutely no connection to the city, but they simply love vintage images. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nori. Um, thank you all for joining with us. Um, if you just join me in thanking Nori Wilson. Um, there are more events on at the Festival Hub this week. Uh, tomorrow there is a story of a different square in Glasgow. It's Blythewood Square with Graham Smith. Um, on Wednesday at 7.30, Professor Jack Halberstam is joining us from New York for his lecture, Collapsed Demolition and the Queer Geographies. Um, on Thursday, we have a lecture from Chris Leslie. Um, and another one for some, some philosophers from the University of Glasgow. And there's more um, stuff happening over the weekend. So please, I do encourage you to have a look at the festival website and, and join us again. Um, and if we could just have one more round of applause for the volunteers who have been helping us tonight. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Good night.